Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the second sec uh, session of the Post-War Area Studies Group. Um, our topic for this session is Post-45 State of the Field. Uh, I'll introduce our three speakers, and then we'll hear from each of the uh, speakers in turn. Um, so first, we'll hear from Nicole Dibb, who is uh, Assistant Professor in the English Department at Southern Utah University. She specializes in contemporary American literature, comparative ethnic approaches to literary studies, critical race studies, and road trip narratives. Uh, then we'll hear from Jennifer Gutman, who is a joint PhD candidate in English and Comparative Media at Vanderbilt University. She works on experiments in contemporary fiction, especially the novel form in the Anthropocene. And finally, we'll hear from Jacqueline Furch, who is a professor of English at the University of North, North Texas and chair of the post-war faculty colloquium. Um, thank you. I'll hand things over to Nicole first. Great. Thank you so much, Florian. Uh, and thanks so much to everyone for being here and those who are tuning in from afar <laughs> a couple of weeks from now. Uh, so the title of my talk is, um, let me actually go ahead and share my screen. Um, I think you all can see the PowerPoint over here. Perfect. So the title of my talk is The More Things Change, uh, Internment Narratives and the Long 20th Century. Um, like Baron before me, of course, with the pandemic, things changed a little bit, but the, the talk has generally stayed true to what I was intending. And it's really in part uh, because of the conversation we had at the last post-war ALA session uh, where I've begun to kind of think about the implication and the importance of the name post-war uh, in its name and in the motion kind of suggested by post, there's a conflict between the direction of moving forward, getting post something uh, that comes into conflict with the thing itself. Can we be post-war if we're always referring to it? Um, but rather than seeing that as a problem in the construction of post-war studies, I realized it was a helpful way to understand my own research on the relationship between iconic mobility in the form of American road trip narratives and the immobilization that these trips have actually relied on or helped dissect depending on the author. So I wanted to dive a little further into this contradiction by thinking about the post as it appears in two post-war novels uh, that each engage with Japanese and Japanese American internment during World War II. Uh, not by placing the narratives in the camps, but rather by kind of driving around the topic uh, literally and figuratively. And read together, they, they create a bit of an archive that is unfortunately ever more prescient today, one that argues for amnesia when it comes to the history of internment within the borders of the US. So thinking about the post and post-war as an invitation to continue making connections rather than as a label equaling a hard stop uh, has led me to think about the contours of a journey that might not have an ending locatable in our current social paradigms and ways of thinking about being and connecting in the world. The first narrative that exemplifies this paradigm of the troubled post is No No Boy, written by John Okada and published in 1957. Okada tells the fictional story of Ichiro Yamada, a young Nisei or second generation Japanese American man who during his second year of internment in 1943 uh, was given the loyalty questionnaire, uh, which included two questions that amount to, will you serve in the armed forces of the US and will you swear allegiance to the US and forswear allegiance to the Japanese emperor or any other foreign government. The novel's title comes from Ichiro's answer to these two questions, no and no. And he then spends the next two years in prison. The war ends and the novel begins with Ichiro's arrival at his parents' home in Seattle after his release from prison. The belated popularity of Okada's novel and a recent resurgence in interest tells the history of Nono Boy's role in the resistance against the cultural amnesia surrounding Japanese internment in the US. The novel was somewhat ignored after its initial publication in 1957 when the editors of the foundational 1974 anthology, i.e. an anthology of Asian American writers, found a copy of the first edition in 1971, they made plans to include a chapter of the novel in that anthology and later republished the novel in its entirety in 1976. Uh, the novel is now a mainstay in Asian American and American literature syllabi, and a 2018 book edited by Frank Abe, 
Greg Robinson and Floyd Chung entitled John Okada, The Life and Rediscovered Work of the Author of No No Boy, offers a powerful new study of Okada's life and influence. While we already knew that Okada's own young adulthood was quite different from his protagonist Ichiro, Okada, like Ichiro's friend Kenji, served in the military during World War II, Frank Abe's careful biography introduced two details that were of particular interest to me. That uh, like his character Ichiro, he Okada, he meaning Okada, uh, returned home by taking a half hour bus ride north, not from prison, but from Fort Lewis. And that shortly after returning home, uh, and enrolling at the University of Washington, Okada bought a black Oldsmobile, the same make and color he would later assign to the fictional Kenji. Abe's detailed history added to what had already been a studied question about Okada's fictional account of Ichiro's return after war. Those pillars of mobility that opened the novel and run through its entirety, uh, which were for Okada a way to enter a new life after his experience as a soldier in the US Army, are the same modes of transport that take Ichiro into the hellish landscape that was life for a Japanese American dissenter after World War II. Okada's novel then becomes a space to unbury the immobilization that was threatened and that came true for Japanese Americans in the mid 20th century. The novel's constant attention to transport is a powerful, seemingly contradictory way to shape the narrative of a young man who is in many ways stymied by the discriminatory and racist choice asked of him. The novel is also unique for its account of the twinned immobilizations represented by the internment of over 110,000 persons of Japanese ancestry in desert concentration camps, uh, including what is estimated to be 60% US citizens, and the roughly 12,000 young men who answered no and no to the loyalty questions mentioned earlier, or who answered yes, but later resisted the draft while they were interned. These men were sent to various forms of imprisonment. So imprisonment within the already immobilized state of being interned. Um, this backdrop of state sanctioned immobilization, both in the form of race segregated exclusion and subsequent imprisonment, which has come to define the most carceral uh, country on the planet, emerges only as memories in Okada's post-war novel, but comes to define in discrete ways the always qualified mobility within its pages. Indeed, Okada sends his protagonist on a ceaseless journey to find some sort of closure, meaning or stability to a life that has been upended by internment and to an identity that was never easy to inhabit due to racism. In Ichiro's drift from one interaction to the other, from his parents to his former professor, to his no-no boy friends, and to his friend Kenji, who served in the army, uh, is a note of the picaresque. His episodic encounters are woven through with the reemergence of Kenji, Kenji's car, and Kenji's slow death. When Ichiro first reunites with Kenji, he mistakenly thinks that Kenji's father has purchased the Oldsmobile for his son, Kenji tells him that it was Uncle Sam and that the car, among other things, was a gift. A medal, a car, a pension, even an education, he tells Ichiro, just for packing a rifle. Kenji's list is comprised of the trappings of upward mobility that the US government paid him for his service and his compliance as a Nisei internee turned soldier. The rot behind these gifts, however, is Kenji's leg, his wound from the war, as metonym and literal representation of the cost of these mobilities. Every few months, he has to have more of his leg amputated as the rot eats its way up. He knows it will kill him. Thus, the promise of mobility via reparations in multiple senses proves impossible and sets up the impossibility of closure or moving post for either character. In one of several scenes of the two just driving around, Okada writes, they didn't talk because there was nothing to say. For a brief moment, Ichiro felt a strange exhilaration. He had been envying Kenji with his new Oldsmobile, which was fixed to be driven with a right leg that wasn't there anymore because the leg that wasn't there had been amputated in a field hospital, which meant that Kenji was a veteran of the Army of America and had every right to laugh and love and hope because one could do that even if one of his legs is gone. But a leg that was eating itself away until it could consume the man himself in a matter of a few years was something else. For hobbling toward death on a cane and one good leg 
seem far more disastrous than having both legs and an emptiness that might conceivably still be filled. Ichiro journeys through the range of emotions that the Oldsmobile inspired through what it represents and invokes both the promise of automobility, Kenji's ability to drive freely because of his privilege as a former soldier, and the falsity of that same promise, which is evident in Kenji's slow death. The post of fighting in World War II or of not fighting cannot be escaped. And in the second example I want to briefly look at today, uh, that's Cynthia Karahata's novel, The Floating World. Um, it follows a family in motion through the eyes of young Olivia Fujitano as she grows up on the road. The novel is published in 1989, but is set in the post-war period, and it covers three parts of Olivia's life, starting with her childhood as she and her family, which includes her Nisei or second generation mother and stepfather, her Issei or first generation maternal grandmother and three stepbrothers travel largely through the Pacific Northwest and Intermountain West uh, in search of the seasonal jobs that were one of the few options for Japanese Americans immediately post-World War II. Olivia's adolescence is largely on the road as well, and the third distinct section of her life is her young adulthood in Los Angeles, ending when she turns 21 right before she goes to college. Each, se each section becomes less defined by traveling as the novel progresses, and since Olivia jumps around frequently rather than narrating in a linear manner, uh, they are each significantly imbued with automobility. In the 1950s and 60s, resentment and distrust towards Japanese and Japanese Americans living in the US led to the migratory existence that Karohara writes about and that is semi-autobiographical. And the floating world initially and unfairly landed a reputation as an apolitical novel, uh, in part because it doesn't really directly invoke Japanese internment in the US, despite largely taking place in the 1950s. The criticism that Karohara received comes from her perceived lack of attending to the call or the burden of representation for Japanese American writers post-World War II. This call was to make evident in their fiction the trauma of internment, the generational divides between first and second generation Japanese Americans, and the prejudice that those same communities experienced in the United States. Such a task ignores the political impact of Karohara's novel, which takes on the quintessential journey to self-discovery via a female protagonist and fills this journey most readily with explorations of Olivia's relationships to her family, her partners, members of the community she travels through and with herself. Her and her family's social position as traveling workers from the beginning offers a shift in the paradigm that is the journey narrative meeting the coming of age story. Uh, poet and critic Garrett Hongo recaps his experience of watching Cynthia Karahara defend herself against accusations that she bailed on her responsibility to the project of historical truth telling, one often imposed on writers from marginalized ethnic backgrounds. Uh, Hongo's transcription of one accusation from an audience member during Karahara's 1989 book tour for The Floating World is particularly interesting. This audience member said, you mean to tell me that you have this family of Japanese Americans running around through Arizona, Colorado, and Utah, and you never say anything from the camps, a scholar shouted. You should be ashamed of yourself for falsifying our history. The question is framed in a way that explains the perceived frivolous nature of stories about families that are not directly about or immediately referential to the camps or the surrounding trauma. This attitude comes across strongly in the line running around as if being in motion does not give the writer enough time to explain truly important experiences uh, to the Asian American and particularly Japanese American experience. We must see how all the concepts at play in this critique are not as stable as the question implies. Is a story about a family running around post-war not worth the same attention because the plot does not revolve around internment? What the floating world does is reverse the stable geographies of home and outside world by having young Olivia's home be the floating world itself with the trappings of childhood defined by her family's constant movement as demonstrated in her statement that my own earliest memories were of pictures from a car window, telephone wires illuminated by street lamps, 
factories outlined against the still sunless sky, pictures of one world fading as another took its place. Karohara manipulates the sustained image of floating in order to comment on the very real socio-political issues of the post-World War II moment for Japanese Americans living in the US. Each job Olivia's family travels to composes an island, which together create the floating world, legible as a monument to the flux between mobility and immobility that is simultaneously offered and withheld by the promise of wealth. The job of chick sexing, um, choosing the or identifying the sex of, of baby chickens, for example, is one such island that is historically prominent in the novel because of its exclusivity to second and third generation Japanese Americans who traveled inland to rural areas from California and other coastal states to take on the work of determining chick hatch, uh, chicken hatchling sex for hatcheries, which were usually run by white owners. And so in this post-war landscape, Young Olivia's family travels through what she calls the American version of the ukiyo, the floating world that she defines for us in three ways. This, Olivia explains, refers to the physical districts in old Japan made up of tea houses, brothels, and public baths, while secondly referring to a feeling, change, and the pleasures and loneliness change brings. As a third way of understanding this concept that drives the novel's form and plot, Olivia then gives us an understanding of the American ukiyo as her grandmother defines it. The floating world was the gas station attendants, restaurants, and jobs we depended on, the motel towns floating in the middle of fields and mountains. Karohara approaches this particular immigrant experience by intermixing the familiar and the unfamiliar for her readers. She translates the ukiyo from its physical place-based meaning to the sensorial definition of pleasure and loneliness, a translation that would make the floating world new again for those familiar with it. And for those readers unfamiliar with the concept, the second translation makes the mundane seem unfamiliar. Gas station attendants, restaurants, seasonal jobs, and motels, these are everyday fixtures of the American roadscape but because of Olivia's family's precarious position as immigrants constantly traveling in search of work, these mundanities help us understand the American floating world as a space that mixes and has always mixed the familiar and the unfamiliar. Olivia also narrates from a perspective that mixes her childlike naivety with her older self's awareness of the political reasons behind her family's migrancy. One example of this is in her introduction to her family's lifestyle, which at first establishes a patriarchal drive mixed with a new type of family unit, that of multiple families driving together. She explains that we sometimes travel the Pacific states with one or two other young Japanese families heading for jobs the fathers had heard of, uh, elaborating that we often moved for three reasons. One was bad luck. The businesses my father worked for happened to go under or the next job we headed to evaporated while we were in transit. Also, it could be hard even into the 50s and 60s for Japanese to get good jobs. Nothing was ever quite the position my father felt he deserved. The third reason was that my parents were dissatisfied with their marriage and somehow moving seemed to give vent to that dissatisfaction. So Olivia here in the narration shelves the political reasons for moving between her beliefs and the interpersonal issues that have often been considered secondary to more overtly political conflicts. Buried in between happenstance, the bad luck her father is subject to, and the personal of her parents' relationship is the casually dropped observation that even into the 50s and 60s, Japanese and Japanese American people living in the US were rootless as a result of state sanction anti-Asian policies and feelings. The importance of feeling to this very political memory can't be understated and is one of the advantages of the child narrator in regards to the effect of this story on readers. And so from the precarious lives of the Japanese migrant workers comes the seemingly contradictory ethos of stability in movement that is described by Olivia in the following passage. If you lost your job in Arkansas, these men could tell you where to find another, usually in a small Midwestern or Southern town, 
people like my father were among the few Japanese who moved to these parts for reasons other than working for the hatcheries. We were bound to the Japanese in Arkansas, just as my mother, father, brothers, and I were bound to each other, just as our relatives in Los Angeles soon saw us bound to the residents of Gibson. So in this way, my family was rooted in a community. I felt safe. That was the thing I liked most about Arkansas. What is most stable about Olivia's life in the 1960s is the near certitude that her family will lose their jobs at some point, meaning a life on the road is guaranteed, and that her community, although it is made up of equally precarious Japanese families, will help them find work elsewhere. Olivia's use of the word safe and rooted asks us to reconsider our assumptions about their meaning. While her repeated emphasis on the bounded nature of the various relationships she invokes in this passage might suggest a necessary rather than chosen kinship on the move, Olivia's reflection also points towards alternative forms of family created by these bonds. Like the group dynamics on the road, the migrant families of Karohara's novel use the road, which they seem to have been exiled to, as a way to put down roots in their shared fight against domination. And so in closing, what these two post-war novels teach us about the post is the significance of remaining in movement, in transit, or in flux. In this case, state-sanctioned and socially inscribed anti-Japanese racism defines an in-between period within which the trauma and indignity of internment can come to light, even and especially in narratives that may seem to travel around it. Uh, I find that Okada and Karohara's novels have as strong a punch as ever today in what they offer readers interested in those years and experiences immediately post-World War II, and in what they have to say about the not forgotten effects of internment as well. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next up, we have Jennifer Gutman. Hi, everyone. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Can everyone see okay? The problem is I can't see you anymore. Okay. It looks great. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, okay. So uh, my, my, my paper today is titled The Novel and Now, Telling Stories in the Anthropocene. Um, the main purpose of my talk today is to consider the, the evolution of the novel within an increasingly popular framework for periodizing the contemporary, which is the proposed new epoch of the Anthropocene. As the form that evolved alongside modern life, the novel has long prioritized human experience over non-human worlds. In realist fiction especially, nature usually functions as a given background on which to project the psychologies and experiences of human characters. This mode of the traditional realist novel has been tied to an environmental consciousness that arose from the long period of relative stability between humans and earth systems known as the Holocene. But according to geologists, the Holocene is drawing to an end. With it, the conventions of the realist novel must evolve according to the logic of a new epoch wherein stable backgrounds can no longer be taken as given. So I'll begin by briefly outlining the relationship between the novel as a form and the geological view that came into prominence in the 19th century and reigned um, until very recent decades, until the late um, 20th century. So gradualism is the geological view that characterizes planetary change as part of a rational and incremental process. This view, which is steeped in enlightenment notions that there's an inherent pattern to the organic world, presents a stark contrast to pre-modern beliefs uh, that natural disasters had cosmological or divine significance. Debjani Ganguly has connected this transition in geological views to the history of the novel, linking Holocene stability with the consolidation of realism as a genre. For Ganguly, the formal naming of the Holocene in 1885 
marked the victory of gradualist views in the sciences, a denunciation of catastrophism as unmodern, and an affirmation of the figure of the man of science as one who writes in the style of the ethically and socially humble recorder of reality. Ganguly observes how in this time, geology centered the human as the species that thrives at the scale of the ordinary and every day, and how narrative forms followed suit by abandoning the generic conventions of the catastrophic and the unnatural that are often at work in fantasy, Gothic, and science fiction. So the scaling of human experience to the everyday would indeed become recognized as a defining technique of realist fiction. And one of uh, the essays that I'll talk briefly about is Roland Barthes' essay on the reality effect, which argues that the existence of ordinary objects in fiction are key to producing a reality effect. These concrete details like Flaubert's use of the barometer do not contribute symbolic meaning to a story or even rise to the aesthetic function of description. Rather, they proliferate through realist narratives to fulfill an incessant need to authenticate the real, as Bart says. These concrete details serve as reference without meaning beyond their ability to signify the real as a category, in other words. As he says, they say nothing but this, we are the real. But what I wanna ask is what happens to the realist detail and by proxy something like the reality effect when the real no longer feels like a stable category or when the stuff that once authenticated the real in fiction emerges as part of a planetor planetary historical narrative that far exceeds human frames of meaning. In the Anthropocene, the human can no longer function as the humble recorder of reality, precisely because human activity has taken on decidedly inhuman scales. A new catastrophic imaginary arises from an awareness of how humans have irrevocably impacted Earth systems with consequences that exceed the human capacity to predict or control. The central paradox of the Anthropocene emerges from a distinctly post-45 context that saw an unparalleled intensification of industrial and economic life, the effects of which would come to radically transform the category of the real that's so central to realist narrative. So while different start dates for the Anthropocene have been proposed, consensus does exist around the idea of the great acceleration, which atmospheric chemist Will Steffen defines as the dramatic change in magnitude and rate of the human imprint from about 1950 onwards. Noting the profound influence of the nuclear age and its resulting spread of artificial radionuclides worldwide, some geologists have proposed for the Anthropocene to begin historically at the moment of detonation of the Trinity A-bomb at Alamogordo, New Mexico on July 16, 1945. Historians J.R. McNeil and Peter N. Gelke refer to the period since 1945 as, quote, the most anomalous and unrepresentative period in the 200,000 year long history of relations between our species and the biosphere, which is a result both of nuclear um, testing and, and um, um, the nuclear age, but also as a result of the loading of the atmosphere with carbon dioxide as a result of more ordinary and everyday activities of, um, of uh, economic um, activity. The effects of this accelerated activity on Earth systems are only starting to register in the increasingly volatile and unpredictable weather events associated with the Anthropocene. So my interest in the Anthropocene has to do with its relation to storytelling. And in the growing field of work on the Anthropocene concept and its variants, storytelling bears an ethical imperative to contend with and perhaps even restructure the anthropocentric imaginaries that have contributed to our current predicament. The question remains though of what representational strategies are best suited to responding to such a crisis. Um, and this question especially bears relevance to the novelistic tradition of realism. Amitav Ghosh um, takes up this question in his book, The Great Derangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable, which argues that the formal scale of the novel, 
keyed as it is to the individual and the minute detail of everyday life and that of anthropogenic climate change appear at odds since any attempt to account for the epic disasters that characterize the Anthropocene would come off in novel, novel form as bad plotting, he argues. Ghosh dismisses the efficacy of the, grand, of the grander scales long at work in genre fiction because according to him, they don't traffic enough in reality. Ghosh's claims have inspired many defenses of genre fiction as a more than apt literary mode for addressing environmental crisis but they have also produced calls to update realism to a changing sense of the real by bringing the genre into closer intimacy with speculative forms. So in her concept of planetary realism, for example, Ganguly asks, what happens when we are forced to confront futuristic post-apocalyptic scenarios in the present? Can the distinction between speculative fiction and realist fiction be maintained in the face of all too real climate cataclysms? And theories of realism in the age of climate change tend to follow this logic. If the real world seems increasingly unreal in its horrific weather events and distortions of earth systems, then realism as a genre needs to adapt and perhaps adopt the strategies of genres like science fiction that are more versed in such outsized imaginaries. But Ghosh's argument also contains possibilities for reinvigorating realism as a mode for the Anthropocene. Though his focus is partly on how the new frequency of improbable weather events presents a challenge for realism's focus on the mundane, he also argues that the category of the real as determined by human ways of knowing leaves much out of the equation. So he reflects on stories that feature um, encounters with the famed tigers of the Sundarbans and um, describes how the mute exchange of gazes with a non-human alterity produces an awareness that humans were never alone and an uncanny acknowledgement that other participants have always played a part in shaping our discussions without our being aware of it. Ghosh's thoughts mirror the opening of another book um, that deals with this topic, Eduardo Kahn's How Forests Think Toward an Anthropology Beyond the Human, which describes an eye-opening encounter between human and jaguar in Ecuador's upper Amazon. He writes that such encounters with other kinds of beings force us to recognize the fact that seeing, representing, and perhaps knowing, even thinking, are not exclusively human affairs. Unlike Gosha's more doubtful take on realist narrative's capacity to represent alterity, Khan appreciates the potential for these encounters to recalibrate and expand our sense of the real, which might be productively taken up by realist narrative. Um, a very prominent novel theorist, Jörg, Jörg, Jörg Lukács, understood the novel as a biographical form that centers human characters as creators of their own worlds. But in turning more frequently to non-human ecologies, many contemporary novels have opened this more traditional biographical form to what Kahn would call forms beyond the human. So with the rest of my time, I'll briefly discuss one such novel, uh, which has been widely celebrated for bringing non-human ecologies powerfully into the domain of human affairs. Uh, Richard Powers' 2018 novel, The Overstory, brings its collage of human characters into unexpected relation with trees and forests, changing their worldviews accordingly. The novel's first imagistic pages characterize, characterize the gap between human and non-human life forms as at base a problem of perception. The trouble with people is that life runs alongside them unseen, right here, right next, creating the soil, cycling water, trading in nutrients, making weather, building atmosphere. A chorus of living wood sings to the woman. If your mind were only a slightly greener thing, we'd drown you in meaning. Here, ongoing biological processes are depicted as the silent engines of life, conducting their crucial work um, beneath the radar of human perception. The repetition of short transitive verb phrases places natural agents like trees in control of their own harmo harmonious regeneration. 
The woman in the passage figures as a passive bystander, oblivious to the complexity of ecological activity that surrounds her. Her depiction foreshadows but resists an impending Anthropocene logic that reveals humanity's unequivocal responsibility for disrupting and recalibrating these earth systems. But the trouble with people at this stage isn't so much hazardous activity as it is a kind of ecological illiteracy. The mind needs to become greener by realizing the logic and beauty inherent to Earth's existing infrastructures. Powers presents the logic of ecology as a challenge to the hierarchies of meaning that humans more commonly insist upon. Surely the destructive impact of human activity on the environment comes into focus over the course of Powers' 600 page epic novel. Um, characters slowly come to realize how their deep indeterminate sadness is an unconscious form of mourning a disappearing world. What the novel describes as a great spoked wild woven together place beyond replacing one you didn't even know was yours to lose. Not only have humans lost this wild place, but they're the primary cause of its disappearance. This passage goes on to say that the planet has been depleted in the process of making us, but that it still wants something from us. What this lost world wants is never directly explained, but the novel shows great interest in the development of new modes of apprehension that only this unseen world can facilitate. In its intersecting vignettes, the novel consistently stages scenarios between human characters and trees that have unpredictable effects on how these characters perceive and interact with their environments. If vision has historically functioned as an enlightenment tool of power and mastery, the overstory suggests the possibility of reclaiming this essential sensory mode from such limiting regimes of knowledge. Multiple scenarios stage new modes of sight via contact with trees and forests. A few examples, a family flipbook project <clears throat> involves photographing the same chestnut tree every day for nearly a century in order to depict the inhuman time of geology. Um, this project is premised on the act of, quote, noticing a thing worth no notice at all. In another section, a dendrologist abandons academic theories in favor of the new scientific mantra that the only dependable things are humility and looking. Elsewhere, a young woman begins seeing and following beings of light after a near-death experience. And in yet another story, a therapist offers her clients an unconventional service, which is to be looked at without judgment for as long as they need. These examples, among others, cumulatively point to the novel's motivating premise that it's amazing how crazy things become once you start looking at them. In these moments of looking, the overstory establishes a new field of encounter between humans and their environments and suggests that such environments are not merely passive or neutral backgrounds for canvassing human desires. Likewise, more human-centric narratives of progress, mastery, and development, which in the novel is often represented by the active threat of the lumber industry, are revealed as deeply suspect, especially when viewed next to the novel's many depictions of more passive and receptive modes of being in and attending to the world. So to conclude, unlike environmental fiction that foregrounds the eventful expressions of global climate crisis, the overstory foregrounds animate ecologies without a clear disaster at its, at its center. And I find that really interesting. If a crisis is to be diagnosed in the novel, it is ideological in scope and rooted in the dominant anthropocentric worldview that has fueled the carbon dependent lifestyles that result in planetary crisis. In staging meaningful contact with ecologies beyond the human, the overstory challenges the novel forms traditional privileging of individual subjects and their immediate social domains. I would argue that such revision is necessary work for the novel to take up since it enjoys a special access to the human centric imaginaries that are most in need of reframing. In the overstory, the first step toward this work is to slow the speed of contemporary life that finds its most destructive expression in the post war phenomenon of the great acceleration that I previously mentioned. The novel suggests as much in its closing image which is an aerial view of downed timber 
uh, in a clearing of forest and these these um, logs spell out the word still. And I, I'd like to suggest that this word isn't a coda in the book, but more like a warning at the onset of, the, of a new epoch, um, which is to suggest that if we want to still be, we must learn to be still. And that's it. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And um, lastly, we have Jacqueline Furch. A review of MLA job lists from the remote and recent past indicates that post-World War II studies remains a perennially undervalued field. Although lists between the mid nineties and the present consistently reveal a smattering of 20th century American jobs broadly defined, much more ubiquitous are positions in the pre-1900 range, especially the currently white hot topic of pre-1800 American literature and in the urgently needed ethnic American literatures whose authors may publish copiously in the post-war contemporary period, but that by contrast may cast post-World War II studies otherwise undefined in a dispiritingly vanilla light, not merely dead white and male, but as boring as can be. Aside from the post-war faculty colloquium, an annual gathering hosted by myself and a steering committee at my home institution of area post-World War II researchers in all national contests, contexts and across the humanities disciplines, I know of no other meeting in literature devoted to post-World War II studies, such as Kalamazoo for the medievalists, ASEX for the 18th centuryists, or C-19 for the 19th century Americanists. In post-world post-war studies, one simply takes one's chance at the massive and freewheeling 20th century literature conference, ASA, ACLA, PCA, ACA, MLA, or here at the ALA. Without a specialized meeting to lend both intimacy and prestige to specialization in post-World War II studies, networking opportunities and the professional organization and recognition stemming from these are much less likely. To that end, post-World War II has no book prizes or scholarly book series that I am aware of, and only two journals, both digital, Post 45 and Orbit, a Journal of American Literature. The electronic origins of both of these laudable publications indicates their relatively recent vintage of 2006 and 2012, respectively. To co be compared against, for instance, Modernism Modernity, founded in 1994, the Chaucer Review, found in 1966, or ELH, found in 1934. Orbit was until fairly recently a journal devoted to Thomas Pynchon and his circle, i.e. Orbit, and each of these series indicates another interesting crisis in identifying our field. When is post-war studies the same as and different from Cold War studies and our postmodern literary criticism theory, and where does post-war end and contemporary begin? When it was founded in 1960, Wisconsin's illustrious contemporary literature would have been home to a post-World War II scholarship. Per its eponymous mandate, however, it has moved inexorably beyond this frame as the decades have progressed. To be sure, CL's mission statement continues to accept all scholarship regarding post-World War II literature. But the examples there include later post-war figures such as Thomas Pynchon, Susan Howe, and Don DeLillo, not mothballed mid-century figures like Mary McCarthy, Norman Mailer, or even James Baldwin. A tour of recent CL tables of contents featuring articles on the poets Tracy K. Smith, Joshua Whitehead, and Lorna Goodison, and novelists such as Jonathan Safran Foer, David Mitchell, and Richard Powers reinforces the journal's forward slant, which is as it should be. To sum up all of this bad news, post-World War studies is not trending now, nor seems to have ever been. In the heyday of its trenchancy, we might guess the 1970s, no move was made to develop the learned society infrastructure that might act as a pipeline for junior scholars today. And in an ever-shrinking job market, post-war studies is repeatedly edged out by sharing a timeline with proliferating fields in race, ethnic, and gender sexuality studies disability studies, popular culture and film, social media studies, and digital humanities. To be sure, the problem with post-war studies from a 21st century standpoint 
emerged from the post-war era's own sharply antagonistic stance toward authoritarianism from the right, recently vanquished by the Nazi defeat of World War II, and the left, the looming menace posed by Mao, Stalin, and the ever-expanding Soviet bloc. For a brief moment in the late 1940s, the difference was bracingly clear. America stood for freedom, while major regions on the world stage stood tragically opposed. But this clear opposition was soon clouded, then made meaningless, by numerous contradictions from the same period. For instance, McCarthyist witch hunts, indistinguishable from the Iron Curtain thought policing against which McCarthyism was ostensibly opposed, freedom now versus the free market, and the clashing political views included within the single concept of liberalism. These contradictions also characterize to a debilitating degree the era's literary output. If the freest figure in post-war US society was the heterosexual white male, he must therefore be the most reliable purveyor of literary excellence, never mind the misogyny, racism, intellectual elitism, and or cultural provincialism that fuels his every plot. As I have written elsewhere, leading male authors odious treatment of female characters in that period dovetailed with the dawn of the women's liberation movement, whose key texts, most famously Kate Millett's sexual politics, called out the worst behavior of canonical male protagonists and their authors, but also seemed to justify the suck it up lady backlash implicit in certain male authors continued treatment. If women were now equal to men, they ought to be able to take whatever is dished out. While crying about misogynist literature reverted these same militant women to the role of frail female stereotype. In the post-war era of civil rights integrationism and black power separatism, African-American characters were boxed in by white authors with the same catch-22. A white author made free with black identity, the paradigmatic example being Norman Mailer's The White Negro, although examples abound in the popular cultural spectrum. Such liberties taken indicated in that liberal author's own mind, if nowhere else, that he had achieved a level of hipness and brotherly connectedness to his black counterpart that was to earn this counterpart's respect and the admiration of hip audiences worldwide. In a course on young adult literature this semester, I taught Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, and Bradbury is readable as the genre equivalent to the serious literary example set by Mailer, at least in terms of the convoluted politics that define his work. As he wrote this novel, Bradbury supported Adlai Stevenson in the 1952 election and vigorously denounced McCarthyism in his frequent publications following widespread acclaim for Fahrenheit. He moved ever rightward, however, throughout a long and vociferous career, voting Republican from the late 1960s onward and even advocating for the Tea Party by the early 20th century. Once again, his post-war fiction classic, Fahrenheit 451, castigates the assault on freedom that was the 1950s Red Scare, as many on the left also did at that time. Yet in Fahrenheit 451, in the also canonical Harrison Bergeron, and elsewhere in his writings, Bradbury denounced a doctrine of equality, whereby the best in society are required to physically and mentally limit themselves so as to not offend fellow citizens with fewer gifts, and promoted a gospel of freedom unhampered by the views of minorities, be these cat lovers, Unitarians, Brooklynites, or quote, colored people who don't like little black Sambo, unquote. In an essay published that same year, Bradbury described his work as a critique of, quote, the bias, hatred, fear, prejudice, lies, half-truths, and suspicions, unquote, running rampant in Joseph McCarthy's America. And writing a coda in the, to the novel in 1979, Bradbury, well on his way to an entrenched conservative mindset, rejected the offerings of this more enlightened moment to stick with the freedom he had enjoyed as a white male author in his mid-1950s glory day. A quote, solemn young vassar lady, unquote, asking Bradbury for, quote, more women's characters and roles and a certain amount of male complaining that the blacks in the Martian Chronicles were Uncle Tom's, unquote, all belong to the, quote, butcher censors whom Bradbury gleefully disregards. Quote, for it is a mad world, and it will get madder if we allow the minorities to interfere with aesthetics, unquote. 
In his dystopian satire, Bradbury's anti-heroes burn every book in sight so as to silence the dissent found within their covers and to usher in an era of universal happiness and peace. Ironically, Martin Luther King's famed manifesto from a decade later, letter from a Birmingham jail, waxes just as satirical on the comforting palliatives of peace. Quote, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block is the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, unquote, when societal dissent was imperative. Never, however, would these two views meet, with Bradbury busily condemning minority views that stand in the way of his own moderate liberal freedoms. Bradbury's brand of smug self-assurance, starting with the unearned assumption that his often simplistic and sophomore writings are aesthetic objects in the first place, is the attitude that has come to characterize the entire field of post-war studies in the minds of many progressive practitioners of literary criticism today. For years, scholars have made careers of calling out the racism, imperialism, and sexual hypocrisy of the 19th century, and yet others have worked just as adroitly to restore the political viability of literary study in this period by introducing new authors and perspectives, or by reconsidering heinous pronouncements to now contain subtextual subversive intent. Few are inspired to do this rejuvenating work for the post-war period, however, because its situation in the recent past bespeaks a chronicle of injuries, in part too fresh to forgive, in part too inexcusable in light of the insights from civil rights and women's equality contexts offered and ignored, and in part irrelevant due to burgeoning counter canons from these same once disregarded minority groups telling a more enlightened tale. One of the only ways that post-World War II studies has enjoyed political renovation is by the shift from post-war to post-modern inquiry. Texts belonging to the post-modern canon, it is understood, reflect the post-structural philosophical sensibilities that hail from a far left perspective and that allow an often just as white male and elite critical cohort to ply its trade unhindered by charts of cultural exclusivity. Some gender, race, and ethnic literary specialists may feel much less concerned about identification with a particular historical time period at all, ranging up and down the centuries or across the 20th century as their intellectual aims dictate, or as suggested above, thinking about the post-World War II period as mainly a jumping off point to a contemporary global era that is more interesting because so much more culturally diverse. Over the course of several book-length projects, my own work has read deeply in African-American literature, film, popular media, general culture, and contemporary criticism, because the narratives of civil rights and Black power are essential to my general view of significant history and culture in the post-World War II decades, and the particular questions that each of these books has asked. But hiring decisions and job descriptions in search of experts in literature of color per se do not and should not include me. And the entire question of history versus identity as a structuring schema for the field remains in flux. To be sure, there is a packed quality to each episode of the post-war period, given popular culture's cultural cultivation to exhaustion of the greatest generation war era, the happy days 1950s, and the swinging but anti-war 1960s. One never knows what to say about the cultural black hole that is the late 1970s, but again, the non-identity of what is arguably post-war's final chapter continues to encourage an underwhelmed attitude toward the period overall. There stands Ronald Reagan at the dawn of the contemporary era, as measured by some yardsticks at any rate, ready to draw all of that negative intellectual energy. And yet already the 80s and 90s are enjoying retro vogue in social media, while even being ironic about Leave it to Beaver is now and permanently a full-blown cliche. A colleague of mine suggested that post-war needs a catchy new name, perhaps atomic studies for those of us working in the mid-1940s to the mid-1950s, psychedelic studies for those of us reading the late 1960s hippie left, or any means necessary studies for those of us focused on the legacy of Malcolm X. In my own work as well, I do what I can to combat the well-deserved reading of the novels of this period as bastions of racism and sexism 
by ignoring that. I do not discuss Norman Mailer or Walker Percy unless expressly requested to do so. And moving productively into other genres may be an especially effective way to get beyond the damaging, damaging legacy of post-war arrogant white men. My own foci are serial publications from Ladies Home Journal to the Black Panther, memoir and autobiography, creative nonfiction and new journalism, music and film, the excellent inquiries into post-war poetry and notably honored prose narratives elsewhere on these two panels this evening are other examples of the ways that the field continues to renew itself in exciting and meaningful ways. But my call here for a rejuvenating stimulus pan, plan or an American jobs bill for the renovation of post-war studies infrastructure and employment will be, I hope, heated as far as is useful. We probably cannot expect the job list to provide improved hiring numbers until the go-getters gathered in these sessions here achieve maximum excitement in the field. Special issues, prestige meetings, and continued excellence in teaching, research, and publication. One of the recent debates in the field um, uh, that I've been interested in is whether it's more useful to think of the period that we're looking at as post-war and mid, mid or mid-century. And I'm thinking of Claire Saylor's book, for example, that came out earlier this year, I think, about that very question. Um, does it make a difference whether we think of this um, period and the field of study attached to it as post-war or mid-century? Was, was that question for me? Oh, any of you really, but oh, if okay. you're free to go first. I went, I had to turn off, I'm sorry, I had to turn off some other video so that I could have a little bit better reception, some other devices in the house. So I didn't even hear a question, Florian, I apologize. No, 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 that's okay. Uh, since um, uh, you were talking about um, how the field can become more prominent, if you will, in terms of, you know, publications, in terms of jobs and so forth, mm -hmm. um, I was thinking of the recent debate about whether the period that we're looking at should be get thought of as post-war or mid-century. What's the more useful term and what are the implications of either term. If we think of the years, you know, 1945 through I, wherever you want to end, 1960 as mid-century or post-war, um, does that make a difference in how we think of the field and how we think of the period? Sure. And, you know, I also want to say that I think the first response to my um, comment might be, you know, why don't you just take a pill? <laughs> so like that there's a really good counter response to well, who cares if it's not all focused back in those post-war decades? And, and why don't we just let folks sort of come and go where they want to uh, from 45 to the present or from 1900 to the present? You know, why does periodization matter at all? Which I think is just kind of an interesting question. You know, I think we'd all agree that history is important, that, that history matters and that, that things change and that not everything is the same from one decade to the next. And that these are, you know, interesting questions that it's part of our mission to help our students think deeply about. So to the degree that history is important, meaningful in and of itself, a, a secondary question could be, what about these particular uh, sub-designations? And uh, my, my one concern about letting 1945 to the present just sort of drift ever further into the present is that those earliest decades are gonna sort of get drifted over, that, you know, many, you know, on many days per week, I find contemporary literature more interesting. You know, I feel more connected to it. I feel like it's got its finger on the pulse of perhaps our students' lives, et cetera. So I guess just in the name of thinking about the way, you know, I also have kind of infrastructure envy. I look at the way the other fields, you know, have managed to hang together and not have an inferiority complex. And I'm just sort of openly curious about that. But yeah, I think, sure, mid-century is probably also what we need at this point. Uh, although, you know, then we lose 
Nicole's very interesting idea about the post, you know, what, what, what that word means and how it can sort of be both and or yes and no, uh, which I thought was fabulous, you know, that, that's extremely interesting so that we continue to hang on to that as an option too. But yeah, I mean, here we sit, you know, as the current um, configuration of the post-war area studies group at the ALA. And if we thought that mid-century was a better term, uh, henceforward or, or for whatever reasons, we should, we should definitely think about that. I mean, I don't mean to draft all of you into permanent membership if you've got, you know, other conferences to attend in future years, but, you know, Nicole and I have talked about how this is the case that every year we get a great group of presenters and then of course COVID hits and that's way harder to hang on to, but you know, then what happens next year? You know, we're really trying to see who, who will be somebody, even if that person wears lots of different hats, you know, who also thinks of him or herself as a post-war literature specialist also, you know? So what, I'll, I'll throw it back to you, sir. I mean, what, do you like mid-century better? And, and why would you say that's the more meaningful term? I don't know, actually. I think I go back and forth between the two terms. I like that post-war keeps a connection to the present, right? So, um, for example, I, I'm thinking of Jennifer's paper, right, which talks about, you know, the the that um, mid-century point as a really a breaking point, a turning point, right, for the Anthropocene. And that, you know, situation, I think it makes sense to think of post war, right? Um, so that, you know, the 1945 becomes this turning point. In other ways, the nice thing about um, mid-century is that it helps us sort of locate historically the years 1945 to 1960 as a distinct, you know, historical and cultural moment without necessarily mapping it onto the present. So I guess it's a non-answer. I don't know which term I like more, but I think they, they open up different possibilities. Yep. Yep. I agree. It's true. That's what I was kind of playing around. This was David Peterson. You, you said that, right, dear, that we should be atomic studies. Did you suggest that? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, 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 my mind is racing now. I should preface any comment that I make by saying I'm apparently now part of the sexy group of 18th century people, which I so didn't know, yes, but okay. <laughs> Because I do, you know, crazy forgotten people, explorers and indigenous writers and so forth before 1900. So I'm very pleased after struggling on the job market for 10 years uh, to wake up and hear that 18th century <laughs> got sexy back. You know, that that's lovely. Um, but it, to, to kind of go to Florian's question, I, I, I suppose one thing I would add um, is part of the problem that the field is so USA focused as though we're the only ones who had a post-war, right? So um, we're not looking at broader literary and cultural issues that were affecting um, uh, not only the United States, but uh, um, post-war nations in Europe, uh, post-colonial nations, uh, in Africa and Southeast Asia and South America um, and, and Asia more broadly construed. So, I mean, is that, is that kind of part of the problem is we, we haven't figured out how our special little post-war atomic age, which I do love, I do encourage you, you, you can take it. I don't copyright it, you can have it. You know, our little atomic age kind of thing. You know, what are the links to the broader um, things that are happening? And is, is that what kind of keeps this tied to Norman Mailer? Oh my God, kill me now. Uh, Philip Roth, God love him. Okay, but lovely, you know, or uh, who is it? Uh, Robert Hansen or, you know, all these uh, other, as Jacqueline was saying, white male, heterosexual, heteronormative writers who get their midlife crisis angst and have to write a novel or a really long novel. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering what you guys think about that. 
um, maybe just this kind of your journal because you know and, and mid-century is lovely uh, mid-century is nice because it links to so many other post-war uh, uh, issues in art and design and architecture in film and so on and so forth that you know and and within, within the field of design and antiques and all this other stuff mid-century modern runs post-war well you could say 1939 uh, to to the 1980s is kind of the zone but okay so you know I'll just throw that out as the interloper. No, I think you're right. Part of the problem is that these terms sort of scream Americanism. And so, you know, at post-war faculty colloquium, we had a guy who was doing German studies and he said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm here. I said, we're not the American group, we're the post-war group. But, you know, you're right. That's a term that already kind of assumes a set of signifiers and contexts and authors that is too nationalist. And, and David, you missed our first session, but Baron did a great job of talking about an African writer, you know, who yet, you know, has sort of circulated through American culture. And here at the American Literature Association, you know, where everything is supposed to be American somehow or another, you know, he did a great job broadening that. And it's it's really hard. It's really hard to you know, to get people over those assumptions that, oh, when you said post-war, you said USA. I remember the German scholar said, you know, the war didn't end in Europe the way it ended, you know, in the United States, you know, that even just post, let alone Japan, you know, that all over the world, the end of any particular political cataclysm is different for each culture, you know, so yeah, it's important. Well, and I actually wanted to maybe use this opportunity to bring it to Jennifer's presentation a little bit. Um, I was really, you know, I think that for my, for me and many of my friends, like the way that we measure time is much more through this kind of Anthropocene framework where like it is, a, and the Anthropocene is kind of an explicitly kind of global context. And, and this also kind of ties into Nicole's presentation, which is so much about mobility and kind of the conditions of mobility. One thing that strikes me about post 20th century, post war, you know, late 20th century is this is the era of in, insane mobility compared to previous generations, right? And kind of witnessing that mobility happening and witnessing the consequences of the mobility and kind of the material conditions of that witnessing was something that I really saw flowing between both Nicole and Jennifer's paper and thinking about kind of what are the costs of this mobility and also like who is entitled to mobility as a thing, you know? And so maybe things that are more located in specific temporal, space space you know physical spaces like war you know um don't resonate as much because the mobility is the word and like energy and these kind of more global issues yeah i would just comment that this discussion has made me think about parallel um debates concerning taxonomy in Anthropocene studies, because there are all sorts, as many of you probably know, there are all sorts of other terms that are being proposed, the capitalocene, the um, plantation scene, the, you know, historians, literary theorists, theorists, cultural theorists, um, working to suggest that there are all sorts of frameworks you could put around periodizing this and thinking about origins of our current state of a kind of you know global crisis and some argue well this conversation should start with a conversation about capitalism some say it should start with a, cop a conversation about slavery some say it needs to start with a conversation about technology and you know um these kinds of developments in the world so yeah it's not an easy topic but i think um i think just the fact that we seem to be in a, a time where, yeah, the Petrocene, right, um, where these these debates around taxonomy are very are very um, rigorous right now, and, and that that seems really important. And 
And I guess in terms of, you know, the American centrism or the Eurocentrism, the Western centrism, you know, as much as that continues to be dominant in the field, I think there is a growing and, and, and vocal, um, you know, body of work that suggests that part of what needs to happen, and I think that's what we all have been doing this evening, well, this evening for me, um, is saying that um, that American centrism or, or Eurocentrism or even human centrism, which is a focus of my um, paper, needs to be challenged, right? Um, so I, I don't know if I have an answer, but yes, uh, um, there's a parallel debate, I would say, even outside of you know post-war studies. That's that's quite interesting. I had kind of a related question from Nicole and Jennifer. Maybe you're going, Nicole. Did you want to respond to Baron's point too? Um, I was going to say a little something about what Jennifer said. Just, I mean, it's all coming to light with the recent backlash against the 1619 project and critical race theory, in particular, which is happening right around us. That that the very terms of of understanding history, whether it's American history or our more global history, it feels sometimes like we're not all operating on the same wavelength. And I don't mean us in academia. And, and uh, Jacqueline, that's why I really appreciated you actually beginning with something like a reference to the job market, curriculum design. Uh, a lot of the questions that we brought up here, I think are both really relevant for our own research, but also as a way to understand how to unpack a lot of this for non-academic audiences who right now are facing this reckoning that is just loaded with misunderstanding about like again what critical race theory is what where should history begin where should american history begin it's all very very everything's prescient all the time but it's all especially prescient in in the past year or so with with the high school and middle school curriculums being changed and college curriculums uh being being um uh, attacked and kind of um you know so on and so forth. But Jacqueline, what, what was your question? Well, this is this is for both you and Jennifer also that I really appreciate it, Nicole, your comment, I think was briefly made, you know, about kind of the the, the social class of mobiliz mobility in the post-war period or today, you know, who, who gets to come and go as she pleases and who has to stay on the move? You know, who gets to put down roots and, and who has to live one's life from when inside a car. And that mobility, of course, was, was king in the post-war period. Even, you know, upwardly mobile white suburban families were constantly relocating because the husband had a new job and blah, blah, blah. And that there is a kind of an ethos of um, having to move on. You know, talk about Prescient, the whole Nomad's Land film right now that's really got us thinking about this. And yet also, you know, to Jennifer's reading of a kind of ethos of remaining, of, of sitting still and not just saying, well, we wrecked this planet, let's go to Mars, you know, let's just find somewhere else to go to. So, you know, Nicole, what is your reading of kind of, uh, I don't know, kind of mobility from a social class standpoint? Do you, do you think in your work about what it means, you know, the, the privilege of being able to sit still versus the, the privilege of being able to come and go. Uh, totally, that's a question that, that is really well phrased and, and has really been on my mind, especially with another thing that's, um, I think, being discussed a little more now is the impact of freeway building on different communities. And so the very idea, and this especially came, I think, to light because of the recent interest in the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre of, of Black communities and the fact that to kind of recover from that, a lot of highways were built that enabled mobility mostly for white folks to, like you said, move to the new job, go to the new school, build this new community. Um, and especially in, not especially, but in, in places like LA where I am right now, there, there's a really renewed interest in how highways and freeways split apart neighborhoods, mostly Black people and people of color, uh, how they provided opportunities for, for certain people and, and denied opportunities for other li literally, you know, destroyed neighborhoods. And that kind of mobility, like to go back to the, the post, is uh, if we're always kind of discovering it and it's always building this new layer on a history we took for granted, and the history was 
why not have more roads? Why not have more ways to travel? And why not have ways to fly? And who are who are those mobilities treading on? And who are and who are they destroying at the same time? Um, and it's it's necessary to to understand where that came from. Like you said, the history is necessary to understand. So anyone who says you can look at that purely from a contemporary standpoint, even though I'm a little bit contemporary myself, I would say like, no, you really have to go back and have a solid understanding of the, the post-war boom and the rules and the regulations and the, the funding that went to highways and cars and all of that. And it's it's necessary as, as kind of a scaffolding, but not a scaffolding you then discard. Because <laughs> I always go back to Patricia Highsmith and these other writers, uh, Ralph Ellison, people who are thinking about cars in the mid-century and, and how necessary they were to understanding contemporary writers interested in, in automobility. And I think it's, uh, to go back to that thing of like the job market and the state that we're in, it's, it's so unfortunate that we find ourselves having to become what we need to be to exist in the profession. So if you need people to be a 20th century person, that's what we're going to do. But uh, it, sometimes those those labels will ignore the fact that it's really important to have the long view of things like Jennifer brought up in her presentation. So kind of rambling. I'm very interested in the highways right now. <laughs> Great. I'm I'm kind of intrigued by the the stream. Again, I'm I'm technically by dissertation pre 1900. Um, Talking about mobility, um, talking about the cost of mobility, who's entitled to be mobile, uh, thinking about the ethos of having to move. Um, it strikes me that none of these are new questions. These are not post-war questions. These are questions that to me uh, in, in my area, starts with the emergence of new forms of capitalism in the early modern period, circa 1500s, see conquest of the Americas, and you wanna talk about mobility. Um, and then you trace the lines of mobility from the late 1400s where it may have taken three months to get across to the 1500s where it's about a month to get across to the 1600s, where it's still kind of a month. Uh, eight by the 1800s, end of the end of the 19th century, it takes 11 days. By the 1920s, it's taking about seven to eight to nine days, depending on where you're coming from in Europe. And I'm speaking primarily of European uh, mobility. So, you know, with the increase of technology, the ability for human populations to move, specifically European populations, uh, the exponential increase um, is, is really quite phenomenal. But, but we um, got to, wait, huh? we got to interrupt because ALA wants us to shut this down at a very specific <laughs> time. We're going to, we're not going away. We're just going to stop the recording. I want to thank Nicole for being a terrific chair of this year's panel. She has taken this group through two or three years. We finally were a couple of panels. She has been a fabulous chair of post-war studies group this year. So thank you, Nicole. And thank you for these awesome presentations. Just great. Really good. Okay.